would like to introduce you to Abu Ahmad. This is his entire house. Yes, this is a fire pit in the middle of the room with children around it. And yes, there's someone out there smoking hookah. And in case you're really wondering, yes, this is a goat, and the goat is watching the news. Abu Ahmad was our neighbor. I grew up in a very poor neighborhood, and our neighbors were Palestinian refugees, Lebanese refugees, and Bedouins. We were very poor, and we struggled every day to afford food. This was my school. And I still remember the day when the United Nations donated two computers to our school. And from the first moment I started using that computer and start learning how to program, I was fascinated. And I felt I was obsessed with it. Because inside, behind that computer, I felt empowered. I can tell the computer what to do, and it'll do it for me. Inside the lab, I was free. Outside the lab, there was poverty, death, and fighting. So from that moment on, I started using every resource I have and read every book I can get a hold of so I can learn more about programming. And by the age of 17, I became a really good programmer, and I graduated from high school, and I got accepted in the engineering school. The challenge was is that the school's tuition was $4,000 a year, and my dad's yearly salary was $2,400. So there's no way I can afford school. So of course, I did the most logical thing, and at the age of 17, I started my first company. The whole mission statement of the company was to make $4,000 a year. <laughs> so I would go and look at any project, whether it takes one day, or takes a year, or five years, I would bid it for $4,000. This was my business card. Um, completely wrong grammar, um, misuse of Microsoft clip arts, and very ambitious statement basically challenging Albert Einstein, basically saying that I'm here, or the mission of my company is to make sure that technology does not surpass humanity. So I started landing projects the, and, uh, and you know, building a lot of new uh, products throughout this company. My R&D lab was the yard, let me see if this plays, was the actual yard in front of the grocery store next to our house. This is me trying to film a video commercial of a smart chair designed that can be used with a handicap and can become a bed and can be completely controlled by a computer. We had four hours of electricity a day, so I had to borrow the, the generator from our neighbor. My assistants were the kids in the neighborhood. One of them is holding the light bulb to make sure um, you know, there's light, and the other one is making sure and giving us directions to make sure that we don't videotape the boxes of tomatoes and oranges that are out there. And the rest of the kids were just happy to be part of the experience. As much as it was the challenge to build the chair, the bigger challenge was to get the chair to the exhibit. My dad owned a Lada, which is a Russian-made car. The interesting thing about our Lada was that it worked 15 minutes at a time. <laughs> so every 15 minutes, we had to stop on the highway, jump out of the car, and start pushing the car until we, get it, until we got to the exhibit. We, I won a lot of awards. This is me with receiving an award with a famous Lebanese singer. The interesting story behind this is that I got invited to this like fancy venue in Lebanon, and I didn't have nice clothes, so I went to my cousin and I borrowed this shirt. And it felt so good because I was wearing a new shirt, and yeah, it looked great back then. 
And the moment I arrived, the organizers of the events looked at me and said, what are you wearing? It was like, just my clothes. And, and they were like, you actually won, and you're going to be on stage. You need to be wearing a suit. So I was very disappointed they did not like my style. <laughs> and I told them that I don't have a suit. So they reluctantly let me go on stage that day. My parents saw me on television that night. And they couldn't explain what I did, and they probably still can't explain what I do. But they made sure that everyone in our neighborhood knew that their son was on television that night. So I graduated, and I got a really good job offer, an offer that could catapult me from poverty to upper middle class overnight. But I always wanted to go to the United States and, you know, and pursue the American dream. So I rejected the job offer, and I applied for a school in the United States, the University of Detroit Mercy. I got accepted, but the challenge was I had the wrong passport. In 2006, a 23 years old Middle Eastern man with mad computer skills, <laughs> it's really hard to give, get him you know, an actual visa to the United States. And the visa officer in the U.S. Embassy was an urban legend. People called her Lisa, no visa. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as I was waiting in the line um, you know, for my interview, and start seeing disappointed faces coming my way. So I knew that Lisa was on the other end of the line. And then it was my turn. So, and then Lisa started asking me questions about the school, about the US. And then she asked me at the end of it a really weird question. She said, how come your English is so good and you know so much about the United States? So I said, well, I almost memorized the two best documentaries about the US. And she was, she looked at me and she was, she said, what documentaries? I said, Seinfeld and The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> so Lisa, the serious person, started laughing. And she looked at me and she said, you'll do just fine. And in a matter of three days, my, you know, they did the background check, my name cleared, and I got the visa. That was the happiest day in my life. A few days after that, this happened. The 2006 war started, and we lived right next to a power plant, next to bridges, very close to the sea. So there was the F-15s and F-16s were bombing all the bridges and the power plants right next, next to us. The battleships in the sea were bombing every car that is driving on the road next to our house. We lived on the ground floor. So supposedly that was the safest place in our neighborhood. And so everyone in our neighborhood, all the people came to our house. Women and children stayed inside the house. Men slept outside on the floor. And I can still remember the feeling that everyone had that day. There was fear, of course. But what was more than fear, fear was that feeling of helplessness. And I can still remember the look in the eyes of my uncle where he's hugging his five years old son. And his son is crying. And I can still remember the stare in my uncle's eyes and that stare of helplessness and the feeling that there's nothing he can do other than giving his son a hug because at any moment, a missile can hit our house and kill everyone that is there. And then my dad comes to me, and he was holding his credit card in his hands. And he looked at me and said, son, over the years, I have saved $2,200. I want you to leave $300 in the bank account and leave to the United States. You're the only one who has the option to leave. You're the only one who could survive in our family. So I don't know what, I mean, 
I cannot just leave you guys and pursue my dreams and leave you here for death. And he told me, so what are you going to do? Just stay here and die with us. So out of practicality of death, I decided to leave. But the problem was how to get to the border and leave the country. Now, the good thing about living where I lived is that our neighbor was an oil smuggler. <laughs> he used to smuggle oil between Lebanon and Syria. So he told me, give him $50, he'll get you to the borders. Saying goodbye to my family was the hardest thing I've done in my life. When I said goodbye to my dad, and as I was hugging him, he fell in my arms, and he could not stand. And for some reason, we both thought this was the last time we're going to see each other. And my mom, and my mom, I, couldn't, I didn't see her that day. And I later found out that she fainted. And no one would tell me because they were afraid that I would change my mind. And then I started my journey to find a ticket that I can afford with the limited money I have. I can do a completely new te another TED talk on how I got from Lebanon to Syria to Turkey and then Germany and then found a ticket and I got to New York. And then when I landed in the US, I went from this to this. And I still remember as I was going out in the subway and walking on the streets of New York, I had a, all I had was a pair of jeans, a knockoff polo shirt, slippers, and my dad's brown Samsonite and a couple hundred dollars in my pocket. With the limited money I had, I chose to pay $15 and go see the Statue of Liberty. This is me, first day in the United States. I had way more hair and way less weight. And that night, in the afternoon, I took the bus and I went to Detroit to start my school. As I got into Detroit, Detroit, Reality kicked in. I had probably around $80 at that point. <laughs> and my school's tuition was $30,000 a year. So I had a cousin in Detroit. Me and him rented an attic in one of the houses. And he got me a job interview um, at the gas station. That was the toughest job interview I had in my life. So imagine going there like the second day or third day in the United States instead, you know, and seeing everything that is very different. There's ga gallons instead of liters, miles instead of kilometers, and they have all these items that I've never seen before in my life. So I used my memory to my advantage and I memorized every single thing that they had in the gas station. All the items, the locations. I printed all the codes that are in the computer and as if I was studying for my PhD, and I memorized everything. And in a couple of days, I got the job. The job was to work from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. at night, be a cashier, but mainly mop the floors, clean the toilets, and change the trash bags outside. So I was happy because I was making some money. I was, in a few weeks, I was able to buy a computer. But the problem is, still, I cannot pay $30,000 a year for this my school. So I was, as I was walking one time in the school, I saw a request for proposals from the US military. So I read the proposal, and I went to the chairman of engineering, and I told him, what if I help you in writing this proposal? Would you pay my tuition if you get the grant? And he looked at me and said, like, sure, why not? So I go back to the gas station, and I start writing work on the proposal. And then I realized how ironic the situation is. You've got this really good computer engineer working at night in a gas station. At the same time, this guy is a Middle Eastern man who's working illegally in the United States, writing a proposal for the US military. <laughs> we got the proposal, we got the grant, and that paid my tuition. So at that point, I had, you know, I was full-time research assistant, full-time graduate student, and full-time gas station employee. That meant I only had five hours of day, a day to sleep. Thanks to the complete abuse of five-hour energy drinks, 
and at the PM, I was able to make it. And then I graduated, and then I moved to Dallas. With $50, me and my business partner started our first company. The company was called Dialexa. The whole mission of the company is help changing the world through technology and help companies to build any product they can think of. So there were, we were so naive that we thought we can do this with 50 bucks. But in a matter of four years, we built more than 45 products for some of the biggest companies in the world. Our team was doubling and tripling every single year. And then after that, we started a new division inside the company where we find a big opportunity in the market, we invest money and build the product and spin it off as its own company that we fully own. So almost as a machine that produces companies. The first product we launched was called Vinley. Vinley is a very ambitious idea and a product that can make any car on the road smarter, safer, and more fun. Imagine making a car that was manufactured in 1996, or even a Lada, smarter than a 2016 Porsche Cayenne, using one small device. It was an ambitious idea, but we needed millions of dollars to do it. So we hit the road, and we started pitching the product to investors. And we got more than 105 no's. Everyone told us that you're crazy, this can be done, we're not going to invest money in you, until we closed an investment round from some of the biggest companies in the world, including Samsung. And then Vinley was born, another company after that. After Vinley, we launched two other companies, and we're still working on launching more and more companies. So I went through all of this today, and now I'm like 32 years old, I'm a U.S. citizen. I have a beautiful family. And this is my daughter, by the way, Miriam. She's not going to go through what I went through. She's going to have her own challenges. And, by the way, my family survived the war. And I went through all of this, and I told you the whole story to tell you a very simple thing, is that your future is not defined by your origins, but by the size of your dreams and the depth of your determination. Never believe that something is impossible because of who you are or where you come from. I am a living proof of that. Life is difficult and hard and chaotic, but you always have the choice to fight for what you want and what you believe in. All you need is to believe in yourself and have the resilience to face these challenges. And while at it, try to enjoy the beauty of all this chaos. Thank you for having me today.